Hello everyone and a really warm welcome to all of you to this sixth webinar that we have at the Media Education Lab. This particular webinar series is called Inequalities and Media Education and I personally love the topic that we're going to be discussing today. Um, it's about using mobile in innovative ways for communication during a crisis. And Professor Kerry K. Stevens is going to be talking about her amazing project, Adapting Mobile Communication for Flooding in Texas. And uh, Professor Kerry K. Stevens is a professor in organizational communication and technology in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. And she's also the co director of technology, information, and policy. Uh, at the Institute there. Um, she has authored over 100 peer reviewed publications in top journals, proceedings, books, and I'm going to be sharing links in chat for two most recent books. One is an edited volume on new media in times of crisis. Uh, this came out quite recently, 2019 downloads. And the other is a multi-award winning book, Negotiating Control, Organizations and Mobile Communication, uh, which came out with Oxford University Press. Uh, she's also given a really cool TEDx talk, so I'm going to be sharing a link to that as well. And with that, enough of me, over to you, Professor Stevens. Thank you so much, y'all. I'm so excited to be with you um, here today to talk about a project that has been <clears throat> ongoing the last uh, two years, and it ended in December. And I would have to say that it's probably the most meaningful project that I have been fortunate enough to get to work with in my entire career. And so I'd like to start off and introduce my team, because this was my field travel team. Uh, you'll see Samantha uh, Varela over here. She was integral to doing our community engaged work. Um, Ifan uh, Zhu was fantastic at taking field notes as we went through and figured out how to work with our communities. And those are the part of my team from the University of Texas at Austin. Something that makes this project really unique is that we also partnered with another university, large university in Texas, a uh, rival university in Texas mm -hmm. called Texas A&M University. And so I have two colleagues who traveled extensively with me there, um, Andrew Wan and Nicholas Diaz. Mm -hmm. You'll also see in this picture, one of the county commissioners in the area uh, that we're gonna be discussing today, a county commissioner in um, the United States is an elected official at what's called our county level. And so a county level is a smaller level than a state. Um, and in this case, this is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas, but it also has one of the smallest populations at only a little over 3,500 people. So let's get started. All right, so this is the area of Texas that I'm talking about. As a matter of fact, people often think tell, tell, would tell me that trees don't grow any taller than your knees in this area because it's a desert. And so you drive through this area, it's incredibly dry. You would never imagine that the area has repetitive flooding issues. But one day as I was driving through, I looked off in the distance and I went, ah, oh, I get it. Look at that, rain starting to form over the huge mountain range that is actually between this community and the Rio Grande River. And so what happens with as little as half an inch of rain um, is this to this community, because there's so much that runs down from the mountains, they call them the arroyos. And that really just means to them a running river of water coming down from the mountains and it's absolutely devastating to their community. But the challenge, they are actually not listed on a flood map in the United States. It does not look like they flood. The reason that's really important is it means they cannot get support 
to try to rework on their infrastructure because nobody thinks they have a flooding issue. Our team was trying to help them uh, solve this issue in the long term. So I thought it would be nice to show you kind of a video of the area because it's kind of hard to imagine uh, this area. And my postdoc, uh, Samantha, is from Mexico. And her comment to me whenever she started working on the project is she said, I didn't realize there were places like this in the United States. And I will tell you, there are a lot of places like this, and there are a whole lot in Texas. And so let's take a look from their words um, for a video. And it takes just a second to start. The problem with the flooding in Fort Hancock East is, be, is that it has become a norm. When you bring it to their attention, it's this eye-opening experience of, oh my goodness, this isn't normal. It's not normal that I need to open my front door and my back door to let floodwaters run through. And it's not normal to have to think about, am I gonna be able to go to work? Is this road gonna be out? Are the school buses gonna run? Fort Hancock's really a valley, so you're gonna see the mountains that are on the Mexico side and on the Texas side, and Fort Hancock falls in the middle, which is what makes it a great farm area. But it also makes it challenging to live in with rains because those rains come off of those mountains. It's a small town, so everybody knows everybody here. With Fort Hancock in general, one of the largest community was built on unusable farmland. Water tends to run there. Right now, that community doesn't have paved roads, it's all dirt roads and there are, you can see those arroyos that are dry 95% of the year running through those communities. What we classify as an arroyo is an area that was made by nature trying to kind of alleviate the water that's falling down or coming down from up north. Water takes the path of least resistance. Whenever it rains, it takes whatever it's in front of it, so there's no stop to it. Sometimes where people build their properties, they don't know there's a, an arroyo there. So when it does flood, it goes through their property, destroys most of their belongings. It's very dangerous rushing water. And the fact that people can't get out of their homes for days, they can get trapped. It's a really serious circumstance. And there's absolutely no data that would suggest that they're in this type of risk. I live in an area where both sides of the road get damaged. I have a paralyzed son, so whenever, if, if, if ever there's a problem or I should have an uh, emergency, there's no way to get in or out. It's not normal to have to think about, I better keep an eye out on my toddler because flash floods, if you've never seen one, you can literally watch a wall of water come down. You will literally watch a one foot wall of water rushing until it covers that area. It can be uh, frustrating. It can be anger to, of thinking that why is this still happening? Having the ability and the right to be educated, just like purchasing a home anywhere else, these individuals need and deserve to know. If it were raining, uh, we couldn't be standing where we're at right now. Right here, it would, be, it would be a river coming down. It goes right through most of our streets. Water just swooping down, uh, bringing debris, bringing tires, bringing tree limbs, bringing trash and anything it can find on its way, you know. Rain is a dire need, but it also is something we have to prepare for the way that someone in the north would prepare for a blizzard. Mostly everybody who has an issue, they, they, they create their own berms. Some you will see built with hay, straw, bales. Tires is very common as well. People just try and, and, and protect what's theirs, and, and I can't fault them for that. We're trying to, for them not to have to do that.
So we have four different community members that we've trained to collect photos and images from the community about their flooding. I was a little worried about would people participate. Literally, within a matter of three days, we start hearing people are so excited. They want to show that they can come together as a community. It's been a real inspiration to watch them take the project and run with it. I think that this community, they are the real experts in what is happening at Fort Hancock. Why hasn't this been fixed in Fort Hancock? It's hard to answer that question, I think because it has not been recognized. We don't end up qualifying for an area that I know has regular flooding because there is no data to show that there is flooding. Our maps haven't been updated since 1985. It goes back to the, f the fundamental purpose of DRIP, which is to help communities take that first step and then have them walk the path by themselves. DRIP's program is not just life-changing, this will change generations in this community. If, if anything were to happen when we go and apply for anything, any type of help, we can say, okay, you know what, this is the issues we have, this is what they represent, and actually give them proof in writing. Showing up is half the battle, and they show up. Que lo que más espero que de este proyecto es que este pues ya se le va a acabar muchos problemas a la comunidad. I mean, this community is everything to me. This is not political. This is about giving basic humanitarian rights to people. I'm just going to do the right thing. What I think is the right thing and standing up for my community and where my daddy lives and where I grew up, that's the hill I'll die on. All right, so I just wanted y'all to get a feeling from the community from their own words. Um, and so they talked about the DRIP program. We were so incredibly fortunate to get to make this video and we actually made the video so they can use it to try to raise awareness around the issue. Um, the, the project as a whole, we spent, I spent actually a year working in the field to try to build trust, to really work with the community and understand what they might need. As a matter of fact, our team started the project out and everybody told me, they said, Carrie, we're gonna build a mobile app and you know this is gonna help everybody. And I was like, okay, great. Don't tell me about your capability. Let me go out and just talk to the communities. Let me figure out what they actually need. I don't want us to be the kind of researchers that go in and like shove something down people's throats that is absolutely inappropriate for their needs. And so everybody was patient and they let me kind of go on my explorations. We did extensive field work in the summer of 2023. I'll show you in a minute that we have a public platform that came out of this a project that's almost ready. And we already talked about the fact that this was a collaboration. I thought I'd also tell you a bit about the research side of the project. Um, essentially, we started the project out by trying to understand the needs of these county areas. And the Hudspeth County was one of eight different communities that we worked with, but this one was the most extensive work that we did. We brought in paper maps and we started the discussion there and people absolutely loved them. The way that they would talk about risk around these maps was just eye-opening. They would come together as teams. They would talk about inequities. I mean, it literally brought out what areas were more vulnerable uh, to flooding and what were not. We also did interviews as part of our research. Now, one of the questions I always get from this project is, were you doing research or was this a community project? So let me just tell you how it worked. I actually talked to multiple um, IRBs and they provided incredibly helpful guidance. And we segmented the project into two parts. The research included the interviews, the observations with the maps, and we used informed consent for that part of the project. But when we did the community project and got our partners involved with the photo data collection, we treated that very differently. That's not research. And as a matter of fact, we trained the uh, community 
uh, photo collectors to actually use media release forms because all that information is going to be made public and given back to the community. Now let's kind of dive into what happened whenever we started working with our community partners. Uh, we were fortunate that some local uh, churches actually provided names of people who might be interested in being our partners. And we had come up with all the data that we could as a research team in terms of maps of their area. And so I'll never forget because the technical team back in, in, the, in the Houston, Texas area, here we were working in a community where we didn't have good Wi-Fi. We, um, they didn't have a, a copy machine. We didn't have access to a copy machine. It was over an hour away to get to the nearest uh, town. And so we would go back and forth each day and iterate as the community members would say, that map's not right. Y'all need different data. And so we really did work with them to try to curate accurate maps of their area. And it was very much partner led. They were the ones who were brainstorming and helping. They know their community best. So they were driving the idea about how we collect this community data. You can take a look here at one of our data collectors. And it was interesting because I loved this kind of multimodality with physical paper maps. You know, she had three different kinds of maps there. One was on the laptop computer coming from our technical team, and she would point out on the computer where it was inaccurate. And then our team would make the changes. We would run into town, make copies every afternoon, print out what the data collectors wanted, bring it back to them, and they would either say, yep, that's accurate, or nope, we got to keep working on it. Here's another example of two of our data collectors actually trying to figure out the best way to structure the data collection in their community. What they came up with was this idea of zones. And one of the challenges with this community is it, it's very long and narrow. And so trying to put that together in physical maps required a lot of tape and a lot of, um, a lot of printouts. And But what they did is they came up with the areas of town that they knew the best. And then they teamed up in groups of two to go door to door to ask their neighbors if they would be willing to contribute to this public data collection of photos trying to reveal the type of flood risk they were experiencing. Now, along the way, one of the things we had to do is figure out how do we get them to collect the images and how do we get them uploaded in some way that is meaningful? And so fortunately, and, and a lot of this was just sheer luck on my part, I had budgeted correctly to be able to not only pay the data collectors and pay them very well um, for the work they were doing, but we also had money to pay for data plans for the mobile devices. Um, what we did, though, is every, our four different data collectors were, they had different levels of expertise in terms of using mobile phones, in terms of working with data. And so we had to teach them how to upload images. Sometimes we were literally teaching people AirDrop as a way to go. Um, and then we also provided additional training. And I want to tell you one of the eye-opening things about the training we did is that I had originally, I'm a very, anybody who knows me knows, I'm efficient. I'm all about efficiency. I'm like, we're going to be in and out in a day and a half. We're going to get this done. Oh, no, that is not the way it worked out. After a few hours, we realized we had to back off on our pace, and we really needed to move at the pace that they needed us to move because they needed to um, these were old iPhones. These were iPhone 6s that I found that were off of inventory already. Um, and part of the reason I wanted that is if they got lost, I didn't want them to be charged for them. And um, so they were older phones, but they were learning how to use iPhones. Uh, only one of them had an iPhone and his was an older version. So he kind of acted as our technical expert on the team. But I, I was amazed at how slowing down the pace and working with them 
made all the difference in the world in terms of kind of the trust level that we were able to build as a team. <clears throat> the All the modifications that we made to these online platforms that they were gonna upload the photos to were partner led. Every time we iterated as a technical team, we showed it to the partners. They would tell us if it works or not, if we're using the right words and very helpful um, to have their input. The other thing that Samantha came up with, which ended up working out brilliantly, is we used WhatsApp for all of our team communication. Once again, uh, only one person on the data collection team had ever used WhatsApp before. So we showed everybody how to download it. We talked about how it can be used. And 90% of those conversations happened in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. I, I understand a little bit, but I certainly don't speak it. But I realized very early on that they are more comfortable as a team speaking in Spanish. And so I said, please do that. And Samantha is fantastic. She's from Mexico. She speaks great Spanish. And so what I would do to follow along in the conversations is literally copy from WhatsApp, paste it into my browser, check the translation so that I could follow what was going on with the team. Um, one of the things that we did is we hosted uh, community meetings, and this was at the community's request, and people were invited, there were flyers all over town, and they would come in and the data collectors would explain a few really important factors to try to help people understand why we needed to collect this data. The term getting on the map was actually something that Quivincia, one of our data collectors, came up with. And, and she was adamant that we need to convince people that it's not fair that we are not on a flood map. Um, but it the irony is there is an area in their county that had a flood uh, a few years ago, and they actually have now been flood mapped. And so incredible levels of inequity. And what the data collectors would do is they would show people the difference between, and you can see in that map, all the blue area, that is all, that is all on a designated floodplain. So they can get access to resources because of that. And she would use it as a comparison point. And then she trained all the other data collectors and would always talk about the fact that we need to get on the map, y'all. And it's only gonna happen if we come together as a community. So these are the amazing partners that collected the photo evidence of flooding and 90% of the people impacted in the community participated. I, I, I was hoping for 30, uh, to be honest. And so their ability to rally the community still gets me, um, it, it gets me emotional because I'm just blown away by the amount of community support that we ended up having. The, um, this is a draft, a very serious early draft <clears throat> of what the online map is going to look like. So one way to put flood risk on a map is what we've done is we've identified the parcels, the locations in the community. And then if you click on a button, up will pop a photo that shows evidence of what type of flooding happens at that area. And so you can literally click through and say, this is the flooding here. This is the flooding here. And since we don't have uh, data in any other format, this is what we are hoping will help them, no guarantee, but we're hoping it will help them build arguments for getting some resources to their communities. I thought I would share a few bureaucratic challenges of this product, of this project, because we often don't talk about this. And oh my gosh, I bet there were so many times I would come back after flying out to that part of the state and just oh, couldn't believe. So first of all, and we're going to have to write about this at some point, our partners' physical addresses in their communities, now remember, they're living on dirt roads. They actually had changed four different times in the last 20 years. Their address, like it would go from being 267 Hill Street to 480 with absolutely no reasoning. So what they all did is they had post office boxes. But the problem is the university wouldn't accept that 
for their payment. And so we had to work through that challenge. The other thing is that our partners, they're, they don't have jobs where they're using computers on a regular basis. So they didn't check email regularly. And so what we would do is we would find out when the university had sent them an email, we would use WhatsApp to remind them to go in and check their email because they had it. They just didn't check it. We also taught the partners how to invoice the university. We definitely used mobile phones that were no longer in inventory because we didn't want them to be held accountable. Something happened to them. And then we tried to leverage the fact that we had multiple universities involved and it worked well. The, as a matter of fact, what one university uh, wouldn't approve as an expense, sometimes the other one would. And so we were able to figure that out by really close partnerships between the two universities. So my last thing I want to talk about is how do we convert our field work into scholarship and kind of where I see this going. You know, one of the things that's been the hardest now that I've done a lot more community engaged work in the last five years is that when you're in the field, you are so busy trying to get the data collected, get the help to the community that they need, and you're on a time clock to spend your money. And so I find that I can't do a lot of academic writing when I'm doing the field work. However, I've really been thinking a whole lot about this notion of boundaries and borders, especially out in that area. Let me tell you what this picture is. Um, just north of this part, and if you look on a map, the state of Texas, and you go into the corner edge, that's where El Paso, Texas is. This community is about an hour, a little over an hour south of El Paso, and the border is actually between the United States and Mexico, and the border is the Rio Grande River. Well, throughout history, the Rio Grande River would shift and move, so much so that we heard a story from a person who said, well, I was born in the United States, but if I had been born a year later, the Rio Grande would have shifted enough that I would have been born in Mexico, and it would have been in the same hospital. So the river shifted for a long time in their history. And I think this really speaks to some of the challenges that this area faces. And uh, eventually they cemented that boundary. And um, so it no longer moves around. But there's a lot of historical, I think, implications around these moving and shifting boundaries. And the fact that things change all the time in these communities and they're often ignored and, and neglected. Another kind of key area that I'm gonna dive into is this notion of sense-making around maps. I couldn't believe how the communities don't, they didn't want a mobile app. They actually couldn't use a mobile app. They don't have reliable enough uh, broadband in that part of the country, and so, they loved the physical maps. And when we started the project, I went back to my technical team in Houston and they said, oh, Carrie, you can't be serious. Printed maps are all they want. And I said, look y'all, they don't have the workforce to be able to manipulate fancy uh, geographic maps on a computer. You know, that is not what they need. They need something to show to their community members and say, Y'all, don't build your house here. Look at this. This is what the map shows. This is what's going to happen. And actually some fancy mobile app or an online system was the absolute wrong way to go. So when I told this to my technical team and they doubted me, I said, come on, travel with me. So actually, Andrew Wan is a PhD uh, hydrologist who started traveling with the team to help me see if I was missing some opportunity in terms of a, a more digital type of solution. After one trip, he went back to the team and said, y'all, Carrie's right. <laughs> they want physical maps, but they're very picky about how they want them. They want them in PDF format. They want them in different sizes. They want them for different purposes. So ultimately for the community, 
We gave them back physical maps. And, and I think that that whole story is really very interesting from a research perspective. So I really want to leave a lot of time for questions. And so I'll wrap up by acknowledging this amazing community. And I have this picture here because one of the things that I really fell in love with was the desert landscape. I would have never imagined how beautiful it is. And I loved my time traveling there and found it to be very beautiful. Um, the other thing I want to both say thank you for and also acknowledge our privilege is that we receive funding from the state of Texas legislature for this project. And then the sad thing I will tell you is that our funding got cut from the last legislature, so the project is over. So we are now looking for additional funds because we have such a successful story to tell. Plus, I want to stay involved with this community. Like, I have fallen in love with this group of people. They're amazing. And I want to see what we can do as communication and mobile researchers to really help them be sure that their flooding risk is visible and uh, is acknowledged in ways that can help them develop better infrastructure for their community. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Professor Kerry Stevens. Okay. This has been such a project, and I think uh, attendees are going to agree that this is the kind of work that really, really makes a positive difference. And the fact that every step of the way the community was listened to and their input was, it, mm -hmm. it's not as if their input was an afterthought that its input was part of the project to begin with. And I think that is something that all of us as researchers, as communicators should really be mindful of when we're doing our own project. Uh, I'm going to open the floor to comments and questions now. And I see Bob is already raising a hand. Uh, Please go ahead. Yeah. Carrie, this was so worth my time. I just, oh. I agree with Devine. I just couldn't help but in Yiddish, we say felling. It was felt so good. And, you know, I, I have a background in community change and civic leadership. And I've worked, I mean, I've worked with, not worked, I volunteered with the single payer health movement. And uh, this forming trusting relationships with people who are different with you, you don't go in and intrude bringing the the community into the conversation. They know what they need. This is such a beautiful example that could go to many different movements that need to be bridging the ethnic, cultural, and class boundaries, and they are just not doing it. Where we're going to go in this country if we don't, I don't know. I'm very concerned. Yeah. Well, so, Thank you so very much. Well, thank you, Barbara. Um, you know, I one of the things that I'm very fascinated by right now is the fact that a lot of the federal funding agencies are now really starting to see the importance of community-engaged work. The problem is, I don't think most of the funding mechanisms are not designed to be long enough where you can actually build the trust and the relationships that you need to. There's a lot of pressure, I think, on people to go in and say, okay, I have a week, I've got to figure this out. And then I've got to design something. That is not the right approach. And I am now more convinced than ever. And it took a lot of me pushing on the team and saying, I don't know yet, y'all, you've got to give me more time. They were gracious enough as researchers who design digital apps and mobile solutions for a living, they were gracious enough to give me that time. And I feel like we found the right types of solutions and the community told us what they needed, but they sure had to trust us before we could ever figure out what would be the right way to go. And yes, the, the places, whether it's the federal government, state government, or a, a foundations, they just want to see how their money is going to work. And they don't, they're not in the trenches. They don't understand that 
there's a process that needs to take place if you're going to make sincere and change that's going to last. I, I don't I don't have an answer for that. You may have to this should go this film should go all over the place. I mean, I'm really being serious. I'm not flattering you. Mm -hmm. And yes, I've been in the desert, especially when the cactus were flowering. It is a beautiful place. It is, and it's 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 a different, it's a very different place. Um, but I, I definitely fell in love with that landscape. Um, I'm going to use my uh, lab core team membership privileges and ask you a question. Uh, you know, sometimes a lot of uh, research grant agencies or foundations tend to have this very uh, techno-utopic or techno-deterministic approaches where they feel like a mobile app is the solution or what is the latest technology fad that can be used in the community and how we can like bring them out of the proverbial dark ages. But then, yeah, they did not even want that kind of solution. They wanted, like you mentioned, physical maps and PDFs. As a researcher, how did you sort of communicate that and how did you go around telling people who build apps that, that, that they don't want what you're building? Well, you know, and that, that was probably one of the biggest challenges early on. And that is why I said, have a hydrologist travel with me. You know, I want somebody, yes, I'm technical in nature and I have a biochemistry background. So I'm a, both a social scientist and, you know, I have this interesting background, but I am no expert in terms of, of hydraulic and, and hydrologic modeling. And so I said, travel with me. And that was probably the smartest thing I did in retrospect, because if I had just acted like, no, listen to me, listen to me, I don't know that it, the project would have been as successful. But once somebody traveled with me who was an expert in the area and said, she's right. I don't think she's asking the wrong questions. I think she's figured out what the needs are. And, and really the compelling thing about this was the workforce uh, ab ability to handle some of these digital technologies. You know, they're in, in a county, in a rural county like this, they're, they hire out someone to do any accounting that they need. They don't have that expertise. So they're certainly not going to have um, someone in the county who can be, you know, piling on layers on these digital maps and working with these fancy GIS systems. It's not going to happen. They can't afford the software, first of all. It's very expensive. Most rural counties can't afford it. And it doesn't get them what they need. And so I think realizing that there are probably places where digital is going to help them, but you've got to be really careful in how you design those solutions and you don't want to like come in with some tool that you've already designed and then kind of force fit it on a community. And I have seen that happen a lot in projects. I actually, I do a lot of funded research and I actually go in and it's almost all interdisciplinary. And before I will work with a partner, I've learned my lesson on this moving forward, I will ask, and I have started asking, do you already have something designed? And if they tell me yes, I think twice about whether I am going to work on the project with them. And instead, I'm like, is it incredibly modifiable? <laughs> because if it's not, I don't know that we're going to be able to objectively go into a community and figure out what they need because we already have a solution. And they know it. Communities know it. When you walk in and they, I had one group of people, I had somebody stand up in a meeting and say, so have you already like predetermined what you're going to give our community in terms of outputs? And I could honestly say, no, I have no idea. And I'm relying on you to tell me and guide me along this so we can provide you something that you can use. Did What was the, the broadband like? Because broadband in rural communities is horrendous. It doesn't really exist. 
the, and I'm just yeah just to add to that question you know the entire idea of the binarization of global north versus global south and the theme of this webinar series you know inequalities i feel like it's so important to acknowledge the fact that you you would assume like especially from someone like me who comes from india you would just assume that all of usa is electrified all of usa is connected all of usa is wi-fi so the broadband is terrible there um, as a matter of fact, we we tried several mobile plans to try to figure out which one would give us the best access. The other challenge that we had is the service that I have was pinging off the towers in Mexico and picking up a stronger signal in Mexico. <laughs> and one of my colleagues got locked out of her U.S. data plan because they thought she was misusing it. And it was literally, we were right on the border. And so the the mobile connections were just pinging off of towers and you don't have any control over how that happens. But um, that was a challenge for our team. And then very slow internet speeds. So, and they are not going to be paying for expensive data plans, right? You just can't afford it. And, in, and whereas in some countries, there's not that much of a difference in terms of, of paying for, like data can be really inexpensive in some countries. In the US, it's very expensive still. And I don't see that changing, unfortunately. So all of those are incredible challenges when you deal with rural communities that even though we have a new initiative in Texas that is very focused on improving the broadband, I am once again, very concerned that people will try to shove solutions down the throats of communities instead of going in and figuring out what they need. In Tompkins County, where I am <clears throat> in New York, the county has now taking it into their own hands because Spectrum, they don't, they're not going to help with anything. So they're taking it into their own hands to try and get out into the rural. They haven't started yet, but this is what's needed. And co during covid those children that did not have a broadband connection, they were virtually screwed, you know. So this is a very big problem. And in certain countries, utility, it's a public utility. You know, this is, and the same with, with electric and gas, it's public. Yeah. None of this, you know, the, the people own, so to speak, the utility. And yeah. it's much cheaper, you know. Yeah, it, so. it is a it is a real serious issue. Um, and something that we're going to have to address. Uh, you're exactly right. The public companies, it's very hard for them to justify financially providing service to one of the largest counties in the state of Texas. I think it's 4,500 square miles, sorry for the miles to everybody who does meters, <laughs> um, 4,500 square miles and 3,500 people. Wow. The vast majority below the poverty level. That's so it, it, it does not make economic sense for the companies yeah. to do that. There have to be other, uh, other motives and motivations for trying to make that happen. And, but it's a very serious issue and it only exacerbates our in inequities that we see. Yeah, absolutely. And the 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 these certain aspects of the government and the, these companies, they don't really care. It's all about the money. They don't care who has, you know. And for me, this is is very problematic. And it adds to the continued inequity in this country if people can't connect on certain levels. And I had a feeling you were going to say that the poverty there, I, I just, I was going to ask you, but I thought that's part of the, the issue. You know? I, I think if I remember my numbers right, it's either 85 or 95% or 90% 90, 90 of the people are below the poverty level. Oh, that's heart-wrenching. That's, do they get medical help? Do they get food stamps? Do they get anything that they're entitled to, so to speak? So the the other thing that was very eye-opening is they are 
over an hour and a half away from a grocery store, y'all. I mean, we talk about the concept of food deserts. Food desert, yeah. uh, this is way beyond what you normally read in literature. For them to go to the grocery store, it's an hour and a half. The county judge uh, lives out on land. She goes to grocery store one time a month, has a big deep freeze, stores up everything, told me all about her strategies. In terms of health care, uh, they do not have an MD in town, but they have a clinic that has now opened up where they do have some nursing care in, in the community but it's, in, it's very limited. Um, the other thing to think about with a humongous 4,500 square foot county, they have three schools, okay? The best way to describe how far apart they are is the former county judge uh, on Christmas for their Christmas parties, which is what they pr primarily celebrate in that part of the country. Um, the county judge had to ask a local rancher uh, to fly him in his helicopter between the schools so he could visit all of them in one day because he couldn't drive. He couldn't drive it in a day. That's how big this county is. There are children that are an hour and a half each direction away from the nearest school. And y'all, this is 2024, okay? This is not history. This is happening today. And so when you look at these communities and the fact that they're not flood mapped, um, you know, it's, and the, the child, there's a big challenge with that. I mean, you can't just blame people for not flood mapping them. These are, this is a different kind of flooding and it's actually really hard to capture this kind of flooding in, in data formats. And so some of my other projects right now are really trying to look at how do we move beyond the types of, of data that we gather right now for floods and really look at some of these flash floods, these floods that are, are intermittent and people are not gonna necessarily be living on a place that it looks like should flood all the time. But we're seeing a whole lot more of this, not just in rural areas with all these dirt roads, but we're also seeing it in urban areas as well. Sorry, Barbara, you're muted. With the climate change, which I don't even know what word to use anymore, everything is, is just exponentially getting worse. And the politicians just are in another world. I mean, how long are you going to wait? And whether you like it or not, it's going to affect you. And where are you going to go next? Are you going to go research? Like I said, you should get this out to lots of places. It's eye-opening. Thank you. And you should, well, I don't know what other project you're going to do, but there's got to be something else with dealing with low-income people that really have no voice in this country that you can help them to, you know, to work with them to make a difference in their lives, you know. Well, I'm I'm working right now on several grant applications to try to do some bigger scale type work because it does take money to do these projects because I believe that one of the biggest inequities out there is that people expect community partners to join them with no compensation. And that is not fair. And so I believe we should be compensating our community partners very fairly. I also believe that we should be compensating people if we ask them to interview or provide survey data. Um, we just, but academia is not set up where we have funds to do that. Our only hope is to go out and get outside funds. I think there's lots of opportunities moving forward to do this kind of really meaningful work. And the people who are doing it in a genuine sense and not just kind of a surface level uh, approach, I think that eventually the funding agencies are going to realize the difference between whether it's a real in-depth, yes, community-driven effort, or it's a researcher-driven effort with the community involved, which there's a big difference, I think, between those two. Um, but I think it's going to take us a little bit of time, and it takes a ton of effort to write these grants. <laughs> so... Um, Anyway, that's kind of the direction that I'm headed, is trying to think about how do we do these kind of things on 
a larger scale? How do we get more people involved? And then I'm also really interested in getting my community, uh, like the local officials, the county judges and the county commissioners in one rural area. I want them to talk to each other. So what I have done is I actually have an emergency manager in one of my rural counties that I've worked with and a county judge that I just put a proposal in together for the three of us to go speak. And I told them both, I was very honest. And I said, I'm looking for an excuse for the two of you to meet. You have similar challenges and you are go-getters and you, um, I think you could learn from each other. So I would love to try to facilitate this co-learning between communities with similar characteristics because a lot of times they are completely left out and it's not that they are technology averse. They actually are very sophisticated. That, emer that rural emergency manager literally just sent me an email and he's like, okay, so I'm using chat GPT to design this and do this. And, you know, they are all about trying technology. Um, it's just what is the capability of the community to use it. I think this is just fabulous and I hope you get all the grants because <laughs> it I'm just I can't I can't get over the fact that we work in such different areas and yet there are such commonalities between the kind of work we do and the kind of results we want to see. Uh and on that note, I'm afraid this is all the time we have for today. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, um, Professor Kerry Stevens and all the attendees and Barbara uh, for your engagement. I'm just adding a few links in. I'm just adding a few links in chat about all the events that we have scheduled. Um, we're meeting next month for our seventh series webinar in the series on inequalities media education. And that's all about conspiracies. So I'm going to see you oh, then. Nice. Yes, it's going to be interesting. And uh, our next Media Ed Club is going to be the last one on the Handbook of Media Education Research Methods. And it's going to be about critical discourse studies. So with that, I hope to see you. And thank you so much for your attendance and engagement. Davina, always good to see you. And thank you so much for what you're doing. It's like you spoke to me. I, I just identified so much. It's far and few between for me. People just don't, they don't get it. They live in a bubble and it's very painful. So, well, go enjoy the sunshine before they charge for it. <laughs> A little humor, have to have humor or will we'll drown in, in the world is, is so uh, just too strange. And Davina, you must be, oh, you're in London. So you're you're ready for dinner. Go enjoy. Right. <laughs> yeah. Have a great day, everybody. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much. Maybe they'll have you back again. Maybe so, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Thanks. Bye for now. Bye-bye.